glad you know him tonight. Are you glad to be in God's house tonight? Hallelujah. Amen. I'm glad for the goodness of God tonight and his presence here and his spirit here and what he means to all of us. Praise God. There's nowhere I'd rather be on this very, specifically this Tuesday night than right here in the house of God, worshiping God in spirit and in truth with the people I know that love God also. <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. Thank God. And of course, if you are a guest here tonight, we, we want to say again, along with Brother Gazandi and, and everybody in the church, we are happy that you are here. Amen. And we want you to come back and be with us many, many times. Amen. Rock Church is now, um, what, about close to, right at, 30 years old, but really it's just a new growth off of an old stock that goes all the way back to the day of Pentecost, amen, amen, and actually goes all the way back to the promises made to Abraham for whoever would believe them. We are, you talk about connected, we are connected. Amen. Amen. And, and it goes forward. It goes forward not only to the rapture and the consummation of this age and to a period of time that the Bible says, whatever this means, this is one more cataclysm, that the elements shall melt with fervent heat and that out of that will come a new heaven and new earth. I don't know all of the monumental uh, confluence of forces that's going to create all of that. But I do know that through all of that, the Bible says that we will be with him and in him and we will be active in his kingdom forever and ever. It's a kingdom that never ends. We, uh, like I said, we are connected backwards and forwards. I don't know any other safe place in this world that no matter what age you are, if you're in the church, you are securely connected. Amen. With prophets and apostles and seers and Jesus Christ himself. So if you're not in the church, get in. What a wonderful thing. Amen. It is to be part of the church. I want to read one scripture and then we can be seated here. First Corinthians chapter three. Um, one, actually two verses, verse eight and verse nine. And it reads like this. This is the apostle Paul writing to the church at Corinth, and he says, Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one. And every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor, for we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. Husbandry means... God's farm, God's cultivated field, God's tillage, like tilling the ground to produce a crop. And I want to, uh, this is a big subject tonight, but we're going to have fun digging into it. Um, I want to talk to you about the subject the search for how to live the Christian life. Okay, so 
you and I got saved. We, we, we came to God. We repented of our sins. There was a radical transformation. How many of you, you know what I'm talking about? That happened in your life. Radical transformation. Amen. And uh, that transformation started us on a new journey. And we went through discipleship. We went through spirit life. We went through whatever the name of it was at that time. Uh, Christian development, whatever. And we, we started on the journey for the search for how to live the Christian life. And we continue on that quest tonight. Can you say amen? We're still, we're still on that quest. Amen. And we're going to learn a little bit more about it tonight by going to God's Word. Would you lift your hands and ask God to touch us in the next while here? God, let the Holy Ghost, Holy Ghost from heaven, come down and touch us, Lord, with your Spirit. Touch every one of us, God. Help us, we pray, in the name of Jesus. Everybody said, in the name of Jesus. Amen, amen, amen. Shake hands with the person next to you. Greet him in Jesus' name. Praise God. Smile at him. And you may be seated. The search for how to live the Christian life. And I would begin tonight by saying that there are simple ways to live the Christian life, which is just get in the right church and listen to the preacher and obey the Word of God and stay full of the Holy Ghost and do all the basics, pay your tithes, be faithful to the house of God and love your neighbor and witness when you get a chance and tell people the truth and just do that. And it works. <clears throat> However, when you decide that you need to give it more thought and you begin the search for how to live the Christian life, you discover that you begin to discover. Sometimes it's a, a, a risky journey. But you begin to discover that there is a considerably higher degree of complexity in figuring everything out than you expected. And so when I say complexity, it, what I mean by that is many and intricate linkages that when you begin to study something, it, it grows and you begin to find that its connections are are broader than what we expected. This is true of almost anything. People who study things usually discover that what first appeared simple uh, usually ends up to be quite complex. For example, right here with the Sacramento River and the American River and the San Joaquin Valley and the irrigation problems, at some point someone decided to do something really simple and something that was uh, obviously altruistic and good and made you feel good and was a good thing. Somebody decided to save the fish. They saw a little fish swimming and they said, let's save the fish. Well, then when they started talking about how to save the fish, then they had to go a little further and they said, well, one of the things we've got to do to save the fish is we've got to have more water in the streams to save the fish. Do they talk about this down at the, down at the capital, Brother Escudero? Yeah. So they've got to have more water in the streams for the fish to keep the temperature colder and to provide more liquid space for them and so forth. And so... If they're going to have more water, they have to let more water out of the dams, which leaves less water for later in the summer. And also, they can't allow the farmers to take, you see how saving the fish have, begins to have many complications. 
And then the farmer says, well, if we have to leave the water in the ditch, then we lose the crops. And then he says, what's more important, human babies or little fish? So then you get into the relative values of life. And then these fish begin to proliferate a little bit and they get in a certain lake. When they get in a certain lake, there are other kinds of fish there that have got in some way to that lake and they eat these fish. So now you've got enough water, even though you're fighting all the farmers and the whole society's in an uproar about it and they're driving their tractors down to the capital and so forth. Uh, so now you, but you've got to get rid of these predatory fish because all of this started by saving little fish. I'm just showing you how things quickly get deeper than you expected. And so then they decide, one of the lakes up here, they decided, some of you read about it, you remember in the last year or so, they poisoned the lake. They, but the poison, and the poison killed everything in the lake, all the fish. And so other people really got uptight about that and went berserk. And the neighbors said, you've poisoned the lake, you've made the, the whole thing toxic, and now there's no fish. They said, well, we had to do that so we could plant more fish. And the farmer's still down here talking about losing his water to save the first fish. So, and his crops are burning up because they don't have, and, and then the bad fish gets back in the lake again. This actually happened right here, not far from us. And so they're trying to kill the predatory fish again, and they're trying to decide, and on and on it goes. Uh, as they started with a good idea of just saving the fish. So things quickly, they quickly uh, take on a life of their own. I'm talking tonight about the search for how to live the Christian life, which can seem like it is just uh, such a simple thing, and, but if you want to get into the intricacies of it, you find out that there's a pretty complex system here. And so... Paul, in our text, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9, says that the church is a building. I'll never forget years ago, you know, I was building buildings before I knew anything about building buildings. And that's a dangerous thing. Because I did not know the complexity involved with something as simple as saying, we've got to get a roof over our head. And, and, and so when you're just learning, you can really make some bad mistakes. And I remember reading about Jack Hiles, who built a whole educational complex in Texas. Later, he ended up in Indiana. But he built a whole educational complex when he was a younger preacher, a very aggressive younger preacher, a very good younger preacher, but didn't know much about building. And built this whole thing. And when he got through, they said, well, how do you get fresh air into the building? And how do you get the air conditioning to work? And he said, air conditioning? Oh, I didn't think of that. And they had built the whole building and didn't have any duct work for the air conditioning. Consequently, that building is probably still there, but consequently, they ended up with all the halls in that building had seven-foot ceilings because they had to take the last foot in each hall uh, uh, contractor Scott and they had to put the, the the vent system in the hall just and so when you walk through the hall it's like you're walking in a pygmy village and your head almost hits Brother Heaty's head would almost hit the, the ceiling in this in this uh, ill constructed building so this building and the last building and I, I was just telling some finance people today in the process of some pretty uh, straightforward and frank negotiations that this is probably the fifth or sixth complex that we built and I was telling them that this is the most sterling silver loan, most secure loan in the history of your company that you've ever had is with the Rock Church because it has a history that goes back beyond its own history of never missing a payment. That's pretty good history. And I was explaining you have to build on the dynamic of who you're dealing with. You don't build on the dynamic of some book that's distance. And so in the process of that, I was talking about 
uh, uh, this building. And this building, it just looks like a building, but it's almost a living thing. It's like a, it's like a human body in that it has a lot of operative systems running through it. And uh, in fact, if you look up here, you will see that these nine lights, one, two, three, or nine or ten, whatever, these nine lights have a little better look, the glow, the light of these nine lights is better than the light of these others. These others are harsh, but these nine are brand new and they've been put in there since Sunday night. And this is an ongoing set of negotiations that's been going on for two years now uh, uh, between the church and between uh, the supplier, uh, the contractor, uh, the middle, the manufacturer, everybody. And, of course, you know how it is in business. It's always the other guy's fault. It's, we didn't do nothing. It's them. And, and, and so you finally pin down them. And so after those two years, they've come to the conclusion that the only way to resolve the problems we've had with our lights, some of them melt, some of them stuff burns up, and all kinds of goofy stuff. It, they finally said, no cost to the church. We're going to replace all the lights in here. That's a pretty good victory that just came this week. Praise God. Hallelujah. So, uh, but that's just part of it. There's electrical and mechanical and communications and there are, there's structural interconnectedness and you can't move just anything because something else is hooked to it. And after a while you begin to realize that there are, there are many, there are thousands of calculations in the process of building this building and there's what they call shear to make sure it'll withstand wind and there's the right materials for weather resistances and and then there's stuff that you use. Uh, there's some stuff we used at one point, and they said, no, you've got to take that out. That's toxic, and, and if it catches on fire, the smoke off of it is poison. Stuff you, you just don't know unless you know. But you find out that in building a building, it's pretty complex. And if you read on uh, beyond our text of verse 10, the Apostle Paul says there that I have laid the foundation for the church, which is the building of Jesus Christ. And he says, I, uh, and he says, everybody that comes after me, they need, and I'm virtually quoting here, they need to be careful how you build on it. Because I, as the master builder, laid this foundation, Paul says, and now you need to be careful how you build on it. And so, and so I don't have the liberty today. I'm 2,000 years after the Apostle Paul. I don't have the liberty to decide how to build on it. The blueprint is already made. The blueprint was made. Let me explain to you that the blueprint for the church was made before the world was created. If you go to Ephesians chapter 1, it says that the church was before the foundation of the world. And then, and then its establishment is from the foundation of the world. It's all the way. We are in something that was, it, it was already put together far 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 before the day of Pentecost all of this is it's in a fixed state in the invisible world and all we're doing in our actions is bringing that invisible into the visible and if we do not give a true representation of the invisible then we are distorting what God is trying to do in the earth and that distortion creates buildings that are not safe to reside in and so this is not us taking our liberty to do what we want to do this is us simply following the pattern that is given to us uh, and that is the standard that we judge everything by aren't you glad you're in the church tonight praise God let's praise God for the church amen and I won't take time tonight to explain all the churches God's cultivated field but it's the same thing you say well I'm I think I'll be a farmer oh okay well I'll go throw some seed in the ground but it's not long until you realize that you got to know about weather. You got to know about water. You got to know about the the, the r growing rhythm. You got to know about soil. You got to know about seeds. You got to know about planting. You got to know about cultivation. You got to know about harvesting. You got to know about equipment. Uh, um, Doug Salters was telling me the other day that he was riding out by Linden and. Um, they rode by, he was with a friend that lived out there, and they rode Linden and Lodi and Stockton is the primary, most of the cherries in the world are grown in Stockton, Linden, Lodi area. In the whole world, that's where most cherries come from, is right here in our backyard. And 
they went about three or four miles outside of Linden, where most of the churches were, and a guy had some property out there, evidently could get it at a reasonable price, and so he planted cherries there, and the trees didn't, they grew up a little bit, and then they didn't produce good fruit, and then the whole orchard died, the whole thing. It, 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 it didn't make it. And somebody said, well, he's only three or four miles or whatever from the other cherry trees. How come it didn't grow there, but it did grow here? And they said, because the guy probably didn't know. He just was going off the way it looked to him from his, what looked rational to him was that if they'd grow here, they'd grow there. It's not that far away. But there is a certain area here in Stockton, Linden, Lodi area that the soil is absolutely perfect soil for growing cherries and the climate is absolutely perfect at the time of the year that they get right for cherries to be able because it's very it's a very it's a very dicey thing to get cherries right without something happening to them and going wrong and and if it rains on cherries just before they get right uh, Doug was explaining to me that this guy explained to him that they'll actually take helicopters out there and they will let those helicopters hover low over those fields at just the right height. All of this is the complexity of just growing a cherry tree. And, and they just the right height so that the downwind will blow uh, the water off of those cherries so that it doesn't get caught where the stem hits the cherry and produces rot and 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 there's a lot of other things about cherries it has to be just a perfect the next time you eat a beautiful bean cherry that brother bob's selling on the side of the road or one of his guys is selling on the side of the road while he makes some money one of the, when you see that take place when you, when, you, when you get to do that and you eat that bean cherry and it's good, you need to know that you're living in the lap of luxury that people all over the world don't know. But you're right here where they have cherries like that. But it, those farmers, you've got to respect. It's a complex thing to be able to produce that. And so, and so in our quest, in our quest for the search for how to live the Christian life, there are... There are challenges in the quest, and there are pitfalls in the quest. And oftentimes the way we begin is because we're, we're, we, uh, we're trying to be honest, we're trying to be objective about things. And so in this quest, oftentimes what you hear is, is that I'm looking for nothing but the truth. I'm, I'm going to look for myself. How many times have you heard this or even thought it yourself? I'm going to be totally honest. I'm going to look into the Bible. I'm not listening to nothing but the Bible. I am uh, totally objective. I'm going to be detached from any feelings, any biases, any environmental uh, effect, effect upon me. Uh, I'm going to be totally distance myself from my upbringing and all the influences and uh, so forth so that I can just have a, an objective look to find the real truth. But the real truth is, is that educators know that there is no such thing as objective truth. Because you and I are in our world. And it is impossible to disconnect ourselves from our organic in interconnectedness with the world that we live in. And so when we say, okay, I'm going straight to the book, the Bible. No man, no church, no tradition. Just going straight to the Bible. The truth of the matter is, is that in your search for how to live the Christian life, that doesn't work. And tonight I want to explain to you why that doesn't work. Because looking, looking only to words on a page is equivalent to reducing living for God to only logic. What I see on this page, I'll do. If I don't see it on that page, I won't do it. Because I'm going to reduce this thing to its simplest form, which is just reason. I'll look at it and see if it says it. If it doesn't say it, then, then I, I, I won't believe it. Well, I would first of all want to explain to you that the search for the Christian life and how to live the Christian life is a dynam dynamic thing and that it is relational and that relational things are not only cognitive they are they are also affective love 
feelings, intuitive. And you cannot, so, you, so uh, uh, none of us want the messiness. All of us want to be able to uh, nicely and tidily uh, compartmentalize Christianity into little boxes so that we can treat it like some kind of physical science project. However, it doesn't fit into that, and you will never get it fit into that. Whatever you get fit into that will not be Christianity. It'll be your concept of a rational attempt to find Christianity. Because Christianity has two dynamic parts to it, and both of them are relational. One of them is what we call unmediated. It is unmedia unmediated relationality. That means it's the Spirit of God that comes direct to you. The other is mediated, that the Spirit of God comes to you not only in the written pages of the Bible, but it comes through the man of God. Because Ephesians chapter 4 says, And God gave gifts to the church. He gave apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers for the perfecting of the church, uh, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body. And so you have, you have this, you have this, this, this three-legged stool that, uh, that it sets on. And uh, one of the legs you can get a hold of just by picking up your Bible. But the other two legs are dynamic. And God has made it where, uh, because he is alive, you're not reading his biography. You're encountering a living person. And so you have those three things. You have the Spirit of God, which is unmediated relationship. That means you straight to God. And he said in John 14, 26, that the Spirit would lead and guide us, or John 15, several scriptures through there, that, that, that we, are, we are led by the Holy Ghost. And Jesus himself said that the Holy Ghost will lead and guide you and will teach you all things. Uh, and so we have that part of it, which doesn't fit within uh, the, 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 the concept of just looking at words on a page. Then you have the man of God. And the man of God, as much as some people love it and others resist it, is part of it. It's part of it. It doesn't matter whether me or you or any of us. This, this blueprint was put together from the foundation of the world, before the foundation of the world. How God's doing this was put together. God, there is no poll on this. God's not voting on it. God's not letting you send your opinion in in the newspaper or on your Twitter as to how you want to vote about this. Nor is he allowing me to do this. This is all done, brother. It's over. You, you, either, you either see it and live according to those dynamics uh, or or else you get off in some kind of distortion because you don't uh, understand them or you don't accept them. And so these are the things that about that are with us. And because of that, because of that, there are many things, there are many things that have to do with living for God, shock of all shocks, that are not found in the Bible. Lots of things. I'll give you some in a minute. Lots of things that have to do with living for God that are not found in the Bible. And there's no way to escape that. The reason is, is because every generation that comes along has new inventions. And so from the Bible, you have to be able to pull out of it the principles that apply to any generation and make application of those principles to particular specific situations within the context of that particular time. Now, you say, well, I can do that, but, but, but wait, that's like saving the fish. There's a lot more complexity to that than you think is. And when you just pull your gun and start shooting, you find out pretty soon that you shot the wrong thing. And before you look down and you find out there's blood all over your leg because you shot yourself in the foot. And if you're not careful, you'll shoot yourself in the heart. I'm just telling you, this is the way it is. And that it requires a whole lot more to be able to get this done uh, right. And, and so how deep does the water have to be for the fish? Well, you have to get, uh, you have to get a hydrologist to figure out how deep the water has. Or, or you have to get uh, somebody who is a, 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 an expert in, in fish or oceanography or, or whatever to figure those things out. Uh, and, and so you get into all of that. And if you try to figure all that out without knowing those things and people that this is where the, this is why God said that he had placed in the church apostles and prophets and so forth because those are everywhere that the gospel meets society's challenges in each generation there has to be application of spiritual 
and of written truths uh, to those particular situations. Now, the spiritual will never, will never conflict with the written, but the spirit makes application of the written, and it makes it two ways, unmediated, an example of the spirit, unmediated. Do you understand what I mean by unmediated? I mean, you've got the Holy Ghost and it doesn't go through me. You got the Holy Ghost, it doesn't go through him. You got the Holy Ghost, it doesn't go through your husband or your wife. It's unmediated. It goes straight to you, you and God. It's there it is. And and when I say mediated, I'm talking about you have the Holy Ghost, but but God gives you the the word of God through the man of God or it may be a woman of God, whoever. And so that is another dynamic relation that you and I have to live within the context of to find the things of God. Do you understand what I'm saying tonight? Okay? So these are the things that happen. So you, you come to things which, uh, uh, for example, uh, someone says um, uh, that was mentioned here the other night, and I'm not getting off in all this, but somebody says, well, what about beards? I don't find it in the Bible. That's one of the latest little deals. No, you don't. What about, so, so I think we're just going to let there be beards. Okay, well, that's fine. We don't have anything about ponytails in the Bible either. So I think I'll just grow me a ponytail. How would I look with a ponytail? Don't you think I'd look cute? Okay, then, well, really, all it says about a man is that his hair is to be cut. So it could be three feet long. As long as he trims the end of it, it's cut because to trim is to cut. And a woman's is simpler. It's just uncut. But, but, a, but a man's, a man's, you know, it, it, it could be six feet long if it'd grow that long. And as long as he just trimmed one hair off of it, it would be taken care of. And further than more, the Bible doesn't say anything about cigarettes. You don't find the word cigarette in the entire New Testament. Nor in the Old Testament. In fact, you don't even have to find any reference to smoking. In the whole Bible. So, the sergeant said, Rebecca lit off of her camel. <laughs> so except for that one interpretation by Brother Sargent, who is a true man of God, we don't have any other references to smoking in the Bible. So, not only can I smoke cigarettes, I can smoke a pipe, or I can smoke a cigar, or, or a bong. Is that what they call them? I don't know what a bong looks like, but when I was younger, it was hooked with the word bing. And they were bing bongs. But, uh, so, besides that, anything natural is good, so I'm going to take up marijuana and heroin and cocaine. Those are all natural products. I'm a nature guy, organic. Health nut. Bible doesn't say one thing, Brother Horton, about heroin or marijuana, at least that I've found lately. It doesn't. So, and uh, might even throw a little LSD in there. In fact, the way I'm preaching tonight, some of you may say he already took the LSD. <laughs> so, I mean, if you want to really get down on it, I don't know that the Bible says anything about dancing or bowling or, or kissing, for that matter. I mean, you know, like before you're married, kissing and making out. Oh, some folks really perking up now. I don't know that the Bible, I don't ever remember reading the word bikini in the Bible. That you should not wear a teensy weensy yellow polka dot bikini or however it goes. I don't ever remember the Bible using the word pedophilia or bestiality. Getting a little more gross here. All I'm trying to show you is, is that you can't just pick up your Bible and say, Whatever I see there, I believe. Whatever's not there, I don't believe. You're not real deep in understanding. Mm. 
because you have to have all three of those things. This is the nature of it. You say, well, I want to... I want to rush it to a conclusion where we've just got boxes where we can say black or white. No. 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 Not going to happen. I'd like for that to happen too. And I'd just say, go to box 26. Don't call me again. But it's not that way. And even figuring out what to do is a complex mess. I mean, I've told God more than once. Me and God's went around on some of these things. I know he's able to kill me, but he hadn't done it yet. To some people's chagrin, but he hadn't. I mean, so we said, you know, you need to get television out of your home, and we, we, we've done that. I mean, television is just, it's, at best, it's banal, which means, and at worst, it's just rancid, destructive, Okay? Well, so we get that out, and God lets them invent the Internet. And so I've told God, God, you're messing with me. I get it where I can box this thing up. I can just draw a line and say, don't do that because it's destructive to you and your children. And people can see that. Yeah, okay, we won't do that. I And I... and. And God, the second thing is, all I'm concerned about is getting people to heaven. I don't care how developed they are. I do, but I don't care particularly. I care about getting them to heaven because that's so much more important than whether or not they're developed and whether or not they're overcoming temptation. I will just keep them away from temptation and let them get to heaven, and that's good enough for me. Leave them alone. He says... You just mind your own business. I'm going to make this more complicated. Here's the Internet. Now deal with that, big boy. So it's 65% productive and increasingly necessary uses with a screen, no less. At least you could have done smake without a screen. Dear God, God. But there's, God, don't you see there's all this other stuff? Yeah. All right, God, I'm trying to keep them from backsliding and you're not cooperating. You're right, I'm not cooperating. You figure out how to preach it. But I'm going to find out whether they really got it. And if they ain't really got it, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let them figure out how to backslide. And if they'll backslide, I'm going to make them do it. Or I'm going to let them do it. However you want to word it, it doesn't cross you up too bad. And so, here I am tonight, caught between boxes and the deep blue sea. And, and everybody that is in spiritual leadership is here. This is not a new thing. If you go back to the first century, the second century, the third century, the fourth century, which most people have not done because you don't have time to sit around and study church history like preachers that don't do anything except sit around. And so I've read a lot of church history. All down through there, these people have had applications of of situations that we don't even know anything about that were devastating dangers to them in their day. They're not devastating. We don't even know what the words mean of things that they were facing. And preachers said, no, don't do that. And then there's others that you and I face that are the same they face. And they say, no, don't do that. Because it takes the man of God, it takes the spirit of God, and it takes the word of God to do this. And so what happens when someone makes the radical approach, like, example, the radical approach, nothing but the Bible? Well, let me tell you, all scientists have a little secret. And all legislators that make laws have a little secret. And all lawyers that's worth their salt also know this. This is a truth. This is a scientific fact. When you seek solutions by pushing laws beyond a certain point, the solutions transform into new, more viral forms of the original problem. 
Let me to read that again. When you seek answers to living for God, or when you seek solutions, rather, by pushing laws beyond a certain point, so you say, there's more criminals, more laws! Throw them in the prison, which is what we've done. We're there right now. What are we going to do with all these prisoners? Because our economy can't bear it. We're going to let them out on the street so they can come and rob you again. Because we made more laws to trap them all. All right, well then let's make some more laws. Okay. This doesn't sit good with the conservatives, but it's the truth. When you seek solutions by pushing laws beyond a certain point, the solutions transform into new, more viral forms of the original problem. And when you make laws to protect people's freedoms, when you make enough laws, you took everybody's freedoms. Or... When you seek answers only in this one place, it ends up, not only can you not find enough answers, you end up with no answers. And you just wander around trying to find your way. So, when you, this is Bible study night. 